Thanks, Jim. Um, I think we actually had another title <laughs> last November when I enthusiastically responded to your idea about the conference and then I was asked to speak. Um, so I'll, I'll know any more, I think, maybe not to, you know, to be as enthusiastic about your ideas. And um, <laughs> I won't find myself st um, standing in front of a group of people um, presenting a paper. Okay, so, um, so stories of the Carob um, tell of communication, work and leisure of people and context, as indeed we've been hearing in the excellent papers before that, which has provided excellent context for what I'll be talking about as well. The second largest lake in Ireland, connected to the sea by river and for a time canal, its islands, rivers, monastic sites, ruins, and of course, hidden houses for the most part, uh, were long a source of survey and interest. This talk, however, will focus mostly on 19th century stories and contexts. The findings are maybe somewhat uneven. There are gaps and questions. Uh, and as always, further research is, unnecess is necessary. Um, much of the area that I'm looking at is quite new for myself. So um, I'll be taking it a little tentatively uh, as I make my way through. However, the, the talk aims to give an idea, however, I think of the possibility of such research as a way of understanding the heritage of the region as shaped and suggested by the Carob. And obviously, going back to the early 19th century, there was much almost manipulation of the Carob to change it to suit the humans uh, in the localities uh, from um, the various changes that were made to it. So, um, I'll be focusing on transport for the most part. Um, the development of improved forms of transport was a defining interest of the era. Uh, Mid-century, for instance, mid-19th century, there was intense negotiation uh, in attempts to establish Galway as a transatlantic port, for instance. Uh, in June 1850, the Viceroy uh, sailed from Galway to New York, which was quite an interesting um, achievement, uh, really, at, at that time although it did run aground, aground on the return journey, so it never came back. Um, however, the prominent cleric, politician, and supporter of the venture, um, Father Peter Daly, and people may or may not have heard of him, but he was one of these kind of um, you know, charismatic um, um, clerics uh, of the era, who was also a politician, um, had a boat named after him, um, the Father Daly. And this was kind of given almost as an, as an honouring of it. So he was, there was a Father Daly which operated around the bay. In 1850 also, still mid-century, um, the P.S. O'Connell was operating. Now, I'm not quite sure about this, but I would imagine, or I think, that it was um, honouring Daniel O'Connell, who had died just a couple of years before that in 1847. So I think that, um, what I think I'm learning about this as well too, is that the naming of boats had also interest, interesting social contexts as well. The paddle steamer, the PS uh, O'Connell, the paddle steamer, where a steam engine drives paddle wheels to propel the craft, and I would always think of the Mississippi, I think, and the bigger ones there, it was to become a feature of the development of the Carob, uh, as well as in the Bay, uh, from this period on in particular. There was already steamers on the Shannon and in the, in the canals, and William Dargan, who died in the uh, 1860s, uh, he was a famous engineer of the 19th century, uh, the railway man in England and in Ireland, uh, as well as in the world of art. Uh, he owned, for instance, the Countess of Urn, the first paddle steamer on the Urn in 1842, which unfortunately sank after a fire in 1846. So again, you'll see the accident was always, you know, I mean, was always liable to happen uh, at this particular time. But this then, however, was the world of steam travel. Uh, and along with the extension of the railway was intended to open up Galway, you know, to London, Paris, America, the world. And indeed it did, because as, as we know also, um, which is I think an area that needs obviously much further work, um, quite a lot of persons from Galway as well as the west of Ireland, as well as other parts of Ireland, also um, have histories in the Caribbean uh, and with regards to the management of estates in the Caribbean. Um, and when we're looking at histories of slavery at the moment or enslavement, um, people from the west of Ireland and Galway are also part of that story, uh, which is for another day. The sinking of the Cushlaan Nua, which has been mentioned in 1828, um, when the 19 people lost their lives, tells of practices of using the lake to travel to Galway. Uh, and it, yes, as has been noticed, it's memorialized, I think, in rafteries on a Kroon, also by Shosa Wahene, uh, and more recent singing. Uh, so, you know, so that there is a version of what happened that day through such um, memory making, I suppose, in a sense. And also at Annie Down here, 
I think the drownings also provide stark information about the condition of boats uh, of that earlier era and indeed the dangers of the lake. Um, it was meant to have been a calm day, but nonetheless, the, the, the dangers of the lake need to be taken into account. The steamers later appear to avoid accidents, unlike elsewhere, such as the Erin, or so I've, I've not noticed any noticeable accidents happening uh, on a steamer on the, on the Corrib. By mid-century, mid-19th century, private individuals such as the Hodgsons of Curariva, near Octobrard, were using steamers. And some of the names I have are the Enterprise, the Lioness, and the Tigress, because I think the names are they're, 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 they're great, really, you know. Uh, and they were transporting cargo from their mines in Glan and Mam into Galway. And then in return, they would maybe take passengers back out to Octobrard uh, from Galway. And that, that practice happened more generally, I think, in, in places in the west of Ireland, certainly, if people, if there was a mail van going somewhere, you know, you'd have to bring people back with it. You know, you couldn't let it come back empty or go empty, you know. So it's, it's an interesting kind of a, a practice, a vernacular practice. Um, of the region. Boats, possibly smaller, um, carry turf to Galway from Port Caron, uh, which was part of the Nolan estate, which has also been mentioned uh, earlier at the time, and mid-century owned by Marianne. And also, um, the, the family was, uh, of course, the, the main, a, a, a big name associate of the family was John Philip Nolan, who was a Home Rule MP from 1872 to about um, 1906. So this would have been, you know, the Catholic landed families um, of, the, of, of the region um, who were prominent and, and powerful indeed at this time. Seaweed was also sent down the lake by the boat. So basically, the Corrib, like the coast, was an important thoroughfare. And we're more familiar with what was happening along by the coastline, which um, in the absence of roads or manageable roads, you know, coming from Carrow and Clifton into Galway was, was, um, was commonplace. In 1862, the navigation of the Carrib improved significantly with the introduction of more organized transport. A new steamer, the Lady Eglinton, was launched in Liverpool for use in the Carrow. The boat was 120 feet long, 16 feet beam, eight feet deep. Miss Sanders of Devon performed the, um, the launching ceremony. A description states that uh, the cabin and state apartments are beautifully fitted up, presenting scenes from the mountains of Connemara and the West Highlands of Connacht. The owners were Thomas Imperse, B. Lee Guinness, George L. Staunton, and some of these names have also been mentioned uh, in earlier papers as well. So this would have been part of the local um, prominent and wealthy uh, property classes um, of the period. The, the purses would have been big, name in, big names in, in 19th century Galway, connected with distilleries uh, and land. Um, George L. Staunton from Clyda, I imagine that's the, the Staunton family from Clyda near Hedford. And B. Lee Guinness, Benjamin Lee Guinness. Uh, the Guinness family had purchased much of the area through the encumbered estates. And in the second half of the century, as again would have been alluded to in the earlier papers, there's a lot of name changes. Some not. I mean, some name the Brooks of Danesfield continued, for instance. Uh, the Americans of Ross continued. Kilkelly's continued. But there were significant name changes mid-century. Um, and the, the Guinness family were able to just buy up uh, much of the area in, in the region where they lived. Um, Benjamin Lee Guinness, um, they, they bought Ashford, for instance, in 1855. He was also an MP in Dublin. Um, his son, Arth Arthur Edward Guinness, uh, later married Lady Olivia Hedges White of Bantry. And in 1880, uh, was raised, as the expression is, to the peerage as Baron Arthelon. And of course, Arthelon was named, as people will be aware, after an island in the Corrib. You know, so all of this is kind of replicating what was happening in the area and that. So basically, the Guinnesses, no need to say, exceptionally wealthy brewers, landlords, and philanthropists, because as we know also, they um, purchased Stevens Green in Dublin um, and opened it up to the public. Uh, so as a result, we're able to walk in and around Stevens Green. You know, so there's that element as well, the, the other side of the landed. Family. The Eglinton was associated the Eglinton was associated with the Carib until the end of the century, about 1862, until the end of the century, running a summer schedule, for instance, from Galway to Kong. This enabled people to go further afield as well, such as to fairs in Ballinrobe and that's, you know, so it was an excellent um, passenger service. This is the steamer that William Wilde uh, travelled on. So I did have him included Mary when visiting Moitura, uh, his home on the Carib, and when of course writing the exceptionally detailed publication, La Corrib, you know, which has an exceptional amount of detail about the area. 
Uh, and he praised the steamer as being most commodiously fitted up. And I think we also get, again, a snapshot, I think, of, of you know, the sensation of rushing, you know, getting the train down from Dublin, uh, trying to get down to Wood Quay uh, to get the steamer. And as he was saying, for there goes the steamer's first bell at quarter to uh, three o'clock. You know, and then he was t- talking to Ellis, the captain, and O'Hara, the clerk, while the steam is getting up. So presumably this is all part of the procedure, kind of slow travel of the era, but it kind of does bring you into what was happening when the wilds were rushing down from the, the Galway train to get to Wood Quay. The death around this time shortly after, I think as well too, in 1876, was to bring this kind of idyll, I think, in a sense, for this family. Jane, um, Willie, the other son, the, I mean, uh, another son, uh, and Oscar, their young daughter, having died sometime uh, earlier. Uh, so from 1876, the family kind of left for London and were dispersed. And of course, Jane, as we know as well, too, Esperanza, well, Esperanza was, a, you know, a significant writer on her own right as well, particularly through the Young Ireland movement and writing for the nation in the earlier period. And um, they all dispersed, buried in different places, um, Jane in London. And I just happened to stand in front of a grave last summer. So that's why it's kind of becoming a bit more immediate um, in Kensal Green, uh, which, the, which she now has a headstone um, dedicated to her. And Oscar, of course, in Paris. Um, but tracing the story is a little confusing at times as well, because the name Eglinton and Lady Eglinton were interchangeable, or at least they are in the records, you know, so you're kind of not quite certain. There was also an SS Lady Eglinton screw steamer, which would, it would have been the next stage on from the paddle steamer, bigger built in Scotland in 1853, which undertook um, significant transatlantic voyages, took part in the Crimean War in the 1850s, uh, and I think took back those cannons to Galway, uh, the cannons to Galway, yeah, from, from the Crimea, or, you know, um, associated with the Crimea. And it also did the, the Galway to Canada, uh, did a couple of trips from Galway to Canada, the British and Irish Steam Packet Company. That, I think, that, that, uh, that Lady Eglinton was not the Eglinton, that, the, the, the other one, because it was too big, it wouldn't have come up the canal. And it was also, um, from 1853, it was um, scrapped in 1892. Lord Erne, as well, owned a steam yacht, the Eglinton. So it was kind of a common enough name that was being used at the time. And it was, that one was totally wrecked in 1870 in shallow water when it was carrying a fashionable party to a regatta. So it was kind of a bit mortifying for Lord Earl that he had these people on board and the, and the ship just, the, the steamer just um, collapsed under the, uh, the, the, the accident. The Eglinton name, you know, kind of, so who is Eglinton, you know, type thing. Uh, the Eglinton name, again, as people I think will be familiar with, is central to the heritage of Galway, uh, to the present day. Uh, you know, from the Eglinton, Eglinton Canal, Eglinton Street, Eglinton Buildings, Eglinton Hotel, Baths and Court. Uh, I just saw Eglinton Court just recently mentioned. Um, so Archibald William Montgomery, the 13th Earl of Eglinton, 1st Earl of Winton, was Lord Lieutenant of Ireland for two brief periods in 1852 and 1858 to 59. And as you know, the Lord Lieutenant, the Viceroy of Ireland, was the representative of the Queen at the time, Victoria, or the King. And they lived in uh, the Viceregal Lodge in, du- in Dublin, in the Phoenix Park, which today, of course, is Orson Uchthron, where the President lives in. Um, so they, they were, the title is Scottish. It's not an English title. And there was a castle, Eglinton, in Scotland as well. The Lady Eglinton likely refers to his first wife, Theresa Newcomen, who died actually uh, shortly after this. And she had County Longford collections. She had also lived in India for a while with her first husband before he died. Um, Eglinton himself died in 1861, aged 49. So when they visited Galway in August 1852, while on a tour of the country, they were quite young. They were quite a young couple. And it's often, you know, you know, it's almost tempting to see them as always quite older, but they were quite, they were just in about 40. He was just about 40 when they were visiting Galway. So they visited Galway August 1852. The, looking at Eglinton, I would see him as maybe, if not inconsequential in the history of the 19th century, but unremarkable, maybe. Um, but he was fetid in Galway. You know, he was idealized and idolized, particularly by Father Peter Daly, because they were looking for stuff. Anthony O'Flaherty was also the MP at around this particular time that has been mentioned earlier as well. The Eglintons visited Galway in August 1852 while on a tour of Ireland. They arrived by special train, the train having just arrived in, in Ireland, in Galway, the year before that. Special train met by local dignitaries, cheering crowds, flags, green laurels, bands and banquets. Lady Eglinton was wearing Irish lace. Now this was an important political point to put across as well too, an important part of her role. 
They received addresses from local deputations, visited the show. There was an agricultural show on in Air Square, um, the Queen's College, the fairly new Queen's College, the Clatter Basin, the Corrib. They gave donations to the Piscatorial School and Father Rush because the children had also been singing for them as well. So they also gave donations there. And of course, the visit was to see the opening of the new canal, that extraordinary achievement that linked the Corrib with the sea. And I just don't have time to go into that at all, but it was the Eglinton Canal. And there are some images imagined images really um, in the Illustrated London News, you know, what it was like to be standing there uh, with the, the, the Eglintons um, in the P.S. O'Connell, the paddle steamer O'Connell that I'd mentioned earlier. Um, but um, so that was that fantastic achievement. So all of a sudden the car up, I mean, the idea had been, you know, discussed, well, discussed, um, considered much earlier by Alexander Nemo, um, but it didn't come to fruition then, but, but now it had. So the development um, of um, steamer travel on the Corrib opened up possibilities. Excursions were to become popular and over time more socially diverse among more people. Uh, the railway, which had reached Galway in August 1851 and Connemara 1895, until it unfortunately came to an end in 1934, encouraged tourism. You know, so tourism in the West was exceptionally important. And, the, you know, hotels increasingly were available from Renville, uh, Caroline Blake's Hotel, Linan, the McKeown's Hotel in Linan, Mam, of course, um, Alexander Nemo's uh, old house, Mam, and today Joe Kane's, um, people will be familiar with Joe Kane's pub today, uh, house today. Uh, Clifton Letter Frack, you know, the, you know there, there was, uh, the area was opening up. Tourism was exceptionally important. Once in Galway, once they'd arrived in Galway by train, excursionists could take a trip up the, up the lake on the Eglinton or out on the bay. Um, they could go to the Iron Islands or to Ballyvaughan, you know, for instance. The Vindicator praised the steamboat companies, providing agreeable recreation to the public. And this was a new idea that the public should have recreation. While criticising railway directors for not affording the people of Chewham, Athen, Rye and Ballinasloe Low of breathing the sea air on a Sunday. In June 1836, 1863, <clears throat> the Lady Eglinton brought people from Galway um, to the lay laying of a foundation stone at Headford Church regarded as one of the largest gatherings since O'Connell's monster meetings. That was 1863. So people were interested and curious and the means were there. In 1864, there was an excursion on the Eglinton to Mam and the Hill of Doom to celebrate the Queen's birthday, Queen Victoria's birthday on the 24th of May. There was promise of a first rate band on board uh, and refreshments of the best quality at moderate terms. Great numbers were expected. So we don't know, but you know, that, that was the, the idea. Um, the visit of uh, another um, uh, set of viceroys, the, the, the Spencers, um, in September 1869, also involved travel on the lake uh, as they continued their journey to Kong and Westport. Now, these were the Lord Lieutenants. Uh, these were liberal. He was a liberal Lord Lieutenant. He had two stints in Ireland in the 1860s and the 1880s. And I suppose the Spencers are known today. He was known as the Red Earl, actually, as well, or the, uh, because of their connections with them. Um, Diana, exactly, yeah, that we didn't think we'd be mentioning today either, as well as the Wilds, but however, um, Diana, Prince of Wales. So uh, th that, that was the same Spencers. So their arrival in Galway drew crowds. And it gives an idea, because it's possible maybe to use this information to try to find out information about the lives of ordinary people as well, you know, because if we, can, if we know of an event that took place on a certain date, a certain time, and try to reconstruct that detail, then we can just try to imagine, you know, what it was like to be an observer, or to be either, you know, you know, to be watching on to this. It can, it can recreate a day in the lives of people at that particular time. Into Galway, the windows of Air Square full of ladies wearing handkerchiefs, cheering and bands, the band of the Clog Factory, as well as the 89th Regiment. The procession with the Spencers and the dignitaries and the people went from Air Square, Shop Street, Dominic Street to Nye Lodge, around Bashanthala, passing Queen's College and on to Wood Quay, where the steamer, uh, the Lady Eglinton gaily decorated awaited the arrival of their excellencies and the vice regal party. Uh, at this day, uh, E.H. Purse, one of the, another one of the member of the Purse family, uh, general manager was on board. Captain Ellis, as he's done before, conveyed the vice regal party up the mighty coral. Um, the large number of constabulary stationed on the pier uh, at Woodkey presented arms when the party drove up before the charming little steamer got underway amid the cheers of the large crowd assembled on the quay. The steamer passed the clog factory and the bag factory. Local officials on board telling the Viceroy of benefits of such industries to the town. 
over 400 persons, or hands as they were called, were employed. And according to the newspaper correspondent, the company was building a new screw steamer, the first ever built in Galway. This does not appear to have materialised, and the factory really only survived until the late uh, the 1870s. But the thing is that the clog factory would have been right beside where the steamer would have come up uh, the canal. It's, it's not, it's, it's right, in, you know, if you can think of where the college is today and where the bar is in the college area, if you kind of know that area, so the clog factory would have been around there. And so they were right beside it, you know, looking in. And it was the whole thing. I think the same practices are still in place today where there are maybe visiting dignitaries or where we might be familiar with it from looking at newspaper reports of maybe royals in England in particular, for instance, uh, or those or when they visit Ireland. You know, people are always telling maybe the story they want to hear or the, st- the information you want to put across or they're looking for money. And they wanted to continue, you know, so they were kind of praising the clog factory. It didn't, it didn't last. But it is interesting that they were thinking about uh, building um, the screw steamer as well. Menlo, the jack ensign, the, the, the Union Jack, was flying on the watchtower at Menlo Castle. And we've seen uh, pictures of Menlo Castle as the boat was going past. Dinner was supplied by W&M Murphy Clare Street in Dublin in the prettiest of saloon cabins where every delicacy in and out of season was provided in a style of most commendable elegance. F. McNamara... Not sure if there's any connection or not. Galway supplied the wines. You know, it's like there's this self-contained boat on the Carrow in the 1860s going along when we know from other sources, you know, what conditions were like outside of that. You know, so it's, it's, um, it's kind of like a parallel universe that were happening at the same time. There was a salute of cannon from Ashford Castle returned from the steamer. It was interesting. And at Kong, there was uh, yachts, decorations, people. So, you know, generally in these accounts, you hear of, you know, the people looking on, the people on the keys or the people um, on the promontories uh, on the Carob. Uh, but we don't know who the people are or who they, what they are really thinking. And that's the next step for us as researchers to find out that. By the early 1890s and, and during the steamer's final years, Captain Walker was in control of the Eglinton sa- sailings. And he took people from Kong, Clonborough and District to Galway. There was also special excursions um, from Galway to Kong. The Reverend Berry, uh, who was associated with um, St. Nicholas's uh, Church, Collegiate Church, uh, was to take children of the schools under his charge to Kong's, Kong for excursions in the 1890s. Um, in August 1894, the Eglinton uh, took an excursion group on the occasion of the Octorard races, uh, and another on the 15th of August would have been a key day locally uh, from Galway to Anadown. A uh, low fare of one shilling for saloon tickets and sixpence for second class. So um, it was a busy, a busy route, a uh, busy piece of effort. The 1890s sees further development of note. Um, and again, people you know, may have further information yourselves uh, about, about these developments as well. But after the discontinuing of the Eglinton sometime in the 1890s, the Loch Carob Steamboat Company, made up of local businessmen for the most part, introduced a new steamer, uh, the St. Patrick. Uh, And I think what's particularly interesting about the St. Patrick is that, unlike the other vessels, this one was built in Galway. Um, And again, it was advertised as leaving Galway at 12 o'clock, at 12 noon, with daily sailings to Kong, calling it Kilbeg and Annie Down. In 1898, towards the end of the century, a newspaper correspondent who was watching anglers trying to hook a salmon at the weir uh, observed or saw the graceful form of the new Loch Carob steamer, St. Patrick, bearing down to her berth at the Wood Quay with a goodly number of passengers from Cong. He went off to look further at this truly local enterprise, for the St. Patrick was planned and built in Galway by Galway men and is owned and run by a company of merchants and boatmen, a sound, staunch, seaworthy boat with first-class en- engines from Liverpool, because Galway wouldn't have been able to produce the engines, but they would have been able to build the boat. Uh, people like John T. Miller of Mary Street, who used to work for purses. Um, there was an O. Donnelly. There was a McDonald's of Merchants Road, Leidens, and William Hennessy. These were some of the local names that were associated, the business people that were associated with the um, steamship company. And um, so I don't know anything more about the St. Patrick than that. You know, who precisely built it, where it ended up, because they were invariably scrapped, um, or at least the other boats were, anyhow. Uh, you know, so I think there's a whole story there which is kind of interesting as well to, uh, to take further, certainly. Uh, by 1906, there appears to be competition between two steamboats operating in Loch Carra between Galway and Kong, and the names aren't always given, so it's not quite certain. Probably the St. Patrick and maybe the, um, the Fairy Queen. Uh, something that forced on the fare uh, from half a crown to sixpence, and 
under 16s were half, half fair. Mostly, information refers to, uh, to passenger travel on the Corov. So in June 1914, which is of interest, of course, it's on the cusp of the First World War when really everything changes. Uh, things are not the same, uh, you know, after that period. Um, June 1914, an unnamed Corrup steamboat took a large consignment um, of Darcy's Dublin Porter to Headford. This, it seemed, generated a lot of speculation as to what caused the change from Guinness, because previously all Headford orders were for Guinness. So why did they change to Darcy's Dublin Porter, which was one of the small brewers? There was multiple, brewers, not multiple, but a lot of brewers around. So now we're kind of, I mean, I'm kind of wondering, why did they change? You know, why, why did they give up in Guinness? Um, it was a small brewery in, um, in Usher Street in Dublin, founded in 1740, and it came to close down around 1926. Uh, you know, and I suppose it would be worth maybe taking it further. You know, was there a political dimension to it? Was it to do with um, Ashford Castle, which wouldn't have been that? You know, I don't know, you know, but you do start to ask those questions. Was there some local row going on? Or was it just simply that they preferred Darcy's Dublin Porter to Guinness? Was it cheaper, um, easier to get? Okay, so that was kind of another, you know, um, a piece of information that kind of can lead into asking questions and building stories. The excursions, uh, which were really a summer activity, um, continued. Um, which were, the excursions, which were mostly a summer activity, uh, continued. Um, in, and for instance, to give just some further ideas, in 1908, July 1908, the sodality, and they were kind of becoming maybe more sort of socially diverse as well. In 1908, the sodality of the Blessed Virgin in connection with the Jesuit church organized an excursion to the Hill of Doom. There was over 100. The boys' industrial school band played, and of course this was the part of the industrial school movements that now are coming seen as being normalised uh, through the playing of their bands rather than getting behind the stories of the young boys who were part of that uh, school band. They were permitted to land by Lord Orthelon and they visited the island of Inchigil. Again, we're talking about getting local permissions. Um, which is, uh, I gather it's difficult enough to get into Ashford Castle at the minute, so... Um, Things don't all, you know, things go around in circles as well. There used to be a way in around the back, and I think that there's uh, um, security on there as well. But it's, you know, uh, it's of interest, but uh, or the line will allow them to visit. Um, and again, the following year, 1909, there was another excursion to the Hill of Dune on board the Fairy Queen. This was another one. This had been operating on the Shannon. I don't know much more about it, just that it was a Shannon boat. It was also on the Corrib. And there was further, uh, you know what I mean, uh, the, the commercial club was organising excursions. In 1915, the Irish National Volunteers were making arrangements with the Loch Carrob Steamboat Company for an excursion to the Hill of Dune. So you can see quite a lot of diverse groups. And this continued well into the 20th century. Uh, the, yeah, the 20th century, in the tw yeah, uh, where, you know, groups, I think, like the Legion of Mary and that would have organised excursions, uh, for instance. You know, so it was a popular... Um, undertaking uh, at that particular time. The Countess Cadogan uh, was yet another vessel operating on the Corrib from about 1913 until about 1917. And this was um, a steel screw steamer built by Jim MacArthur and Company in Paisley. It was launched in 1897. It was 70 foot long, 14 foot in breadth, and a depth of 7.3. The Shannon Development Company was its first owner for the River Shannon, and the Loch Corrib Steamboat Company owned it by 1913. You know, so you can see kind of they were kind of um, um, uh, passing on from, from, from owner to owner, I suppose, in a sense as well. Um, the steamer was sold to Nicholas Cook of Aberdeen around 1917, so just before the end of the war. I think it also saw war service on the, the North Sea as well. The boat itself, so the Catagon was uh, another boat in the Corrib. The boat itself is described as beautifully fitted out and there was a large portrait of the Countess Cadogan and her two children, which almost filled one of the bulkheads in the stern saloon. You know, so that's, again, what people would have been sitting looking at when they were taking the steamer uh, up the car as well. Uh, in Orkney, uh, which is where she went to after Galway, um, the boat operated as a South Isles ferry until scrapped and broken up at Granton in 1927. So, you know, the histories of the boat, it's interesting to think that they did spend time in different parts. That there's kind of interesting connections, I think, between people in different parts um, of the, the world uh, through the stories. Beatrix Craven, Countess Cadogan, was married to George Cadogan. He was also a Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, but because the boat was Scottish, it's not necessarily because of that 
that he was that it was named, but that's what the Catagons were. She was a patron, uh, Beatrice Catagon, um, of Irish Industries, lace embroidery, uh, which was an important role for the wife of the Lord Lieutenant to have a role in philanthropy uh, of some sort like that. He was associated with, uh, he was more visible than the Eglintons. These were more visible people than the Eglintons, although there's not as much named after them. But uh, he was involved, with, associated with the Department of Agriculture, Industries and Technical Education, as well as the, as well as the Arts and Crafts Movement, William Morris Movement in England. Um, they had nine children. Today, uh, the Catagon family, they own the centre of London, you know, um, Chelsea, Stone Square and that. They are um, still around. They are, you know, billionaires a number of times over. Um, it's an exceptionally wealthy family. The last boat on the canal, the, the Eggington Canal leading up, was, of course, the Ammo Ammo II, a luxury yacht of the Guinness family of Ashford Castle, which had been sold to Frank Bailey uh, of Air Square, somebody who had an interest in boats as well. And of course, after 18, 1954, sorry, the canal was closed to such traffic and the end of the swivel bridges and so on, which as I said, I'm not going into, but just that it did come to an end in 1954. And I think that some further work is being done or will be done maybe on the Eggington Canal as a way of ensuring that it is central to the life of the city, which is, it, it, it really, it, it really um, needs to be. So um, I am almost coming to the end of the particular piece. And uh, just to cover fatalities, um, none were as significant as the 1828 drownings that I've come across. And I'm just talking about some 19th century examples, nothing from the 20th century. Um, on the 17th of August, 1887, Three young men left Galway in a sailing boat of the Royal Yacht Club on their way to Octorard when they went missing. A heavy squall, it was thought, capsized the boat. Boatmen along the lake searched. The capsized boat, three caps and a pair of oars were found. On the 20th of August, a police constable found their bodies near Clyde at Hedford. Francis Kinkeed was 19. John Thompson, whose father was professor of Greek in the college was, uh, and an engineering student, was 19. And Thomas Roberts, whose father was a clergyman in Octorard, was 18. There was, uh, you know, so the three of them, two of them were buried in Galway and, and Roberts is buried in Octorard. Uh, there was talk of a memorial to the young men, and I'm just thinking about the, uh, um, the Anna Down memorialising of, for instance, uh, which was quite significant, um, and consolidated the story of, you know, Anna Down um, through, through, through the, 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 the poetry and the songs. Um, there was talk of a memorial to the young men and funds were being collected by people like T.P. O'Connor, who was a local uh, parliamentarian, and Mitchell Henry. People will be familiar with them from um, Kylemore. Though it's unclear as to whether it was ever produced, and I've never come across any memorial to the young men, but I have to search a bit more uh, because there was some money being collected. Um, so it doesn't seem that it might have ever materialised. These were well-known families. The King Keats, for instance, just to mention, lived in Forster House. Um, later, one of Francis's sisters, Alice, was a prominent artist. His other brother, there was two brothers in the family, and the second brother was killed during the First World War. So that was virtually the family kind of almost like wiped out to an extent, uh, the King Keat family, circumstances of the time. Regattas, finally, um, regattas. Regattas were popular around the coast, from Cashel to Beladangan, Roundstone, Letchafrak, uh, and on the Corrob. Um, and again, the regatta provides insight into the role of the landed classes, I think, and their interactions uh, on the Carob. The Cong Regatta of 1865, for instance, saw young Mr. Guinness, the son, uh, patron of the regatta, and Captain Lindsay. They were also trying to attract the Irish Yacht Club to come to um, Cong. Um, and again, the steamer, the Eglinton, was crowded with people from the high aristocracy to the humblest working class. And again, it's possible to think maybe also of, you know, the regatta as a kind of a political or a social space for people, you know, the landlord and the tenant maybe coming together. And this was still the 1860s. This was before things really took off again in the 1870s and the 1880s with the land war and that. And before, for instance, the um, killing of Mount Morris uh, that Bridget had mentioned earlier. Um, which happened around this time. And he seems to have been uh, somebody who wasn't expected to have been killed as well, I think, uh, you know, in comparison to other landlords. Um, but he was, and nobody was ever convicted. So there was a whole, you know, things started to change from there on in. There was a lot more fear, I suppose, really, about on the landed classes. But at this stage, people were still going to the regattas together um, to an extent. Captain Lindsay is mentioned, and I just wanted to mention a word about him because he kind of in, it intrigued me a little bit because, you know, so little was known about him. Captain Lindsay, Captain Frederick Lindsay, he lived in, in a Shanbo Island, and people who are from the Octorard area will know it, 
fairly well, I imagine, uh, near up to Rarard. He was from County Tyrone, Captain, this Captain Lindsay, who was in the regatta in, in Cong. From County Tyrone, ex-army, a magistrate with an interest in yachts. Um, he once took a yacht from Dublin over to the West, for instance. Um, a report in 1860, and he lived in Inishanbo. Um, a report in 1865 likened uh, Inishanbo to Robinson Crusoe's settlement, something that may have appeared to Lindsay because he once dressed up as Robinson Crusoe at a fancy dress party. Sometimes, you know, they had so much money, or at one stage they had so much money. And by the time we're encountering them, you know, they've, it's done something to them, I think, you know. And the money is gone, but, um, you know, I think the psychologist needs to enter the story as well, a lot of the time, no question. Um, Inishanbo, originally part of the O'Flaherty estate, and Mary and uh, Bridget will have traced that as well too, uh, had been sold on uh, under the landed estates courts in 1864. Lindsay himself died in a fire under unusual circumstances in County Cavan in 1877. Information about the island, however, which was up for sale again in July 1879, I think offers really extraordinary detail about this kind of self-contained and privileged world um, that was in, in Ishanbo. When you see, you know what I mean, the, the, the contents of the house, um, the contents of, you know, the, 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 the um, what was around the house, the, the animals that were there, uh, and the furniture and the, the glass, it's just really instructive to read that and, and to be aware that this, this, this world was there. Among the new, numerous items, there was a steam launch by Yarrow. Uh, Yarrow and Headley of Poplar in London was one of the places that, that made uh, such launches. So the man was obviously really keen um, on the world of the yacht or the world of boating. Um, and I'm just kind of continuing in, along, uh, down a certain rabbit hole uh, after Captain Lindsay at the moment to get a bit more detail about them. Um, later, Captain Edward Ankatel Jones, um, who died in 1933, lived on the island and it's associated with him, and his sister, Countess Metaxa, that people will also be familiar with because she continued living on after Rard. And that's a further set of stories that are equally interesting as well, too, especially her story, I think. The role of titled men continued into the 20th century, although such influences was weakening. Sir Valentine Blake, for instance, had a certain you know, continuation with the Cara Brigata uh, into the 20th century. The organizers in 1909 who welcome, welcomed rowing uh, as a mostly manly exercise um, and was mostly dominated by, by men at this particular point, although not all. They were, they were starting to entertain people uh, in 1909 with the West Awake and the wearing of the green. So, you know perspectives were shifting, were changing. There was new, you know, they were getting a bit robust, getting a bit bold, you know. They had been for some time, but anyhow, so there, there, there was a change, a shift. The Kilbeg Regatta, um, and this is the final example, the Kilbeg Regatta of 1911, held under the patronage of Lord, Lord Headley, uh, saw the St. Patrick bring crowds from Kong and Dr. Rard and the Fairy Queen from Galway. Frank Bailey had a large crowd in his motorboat, the Single E. It was a rainy day, but it didn't discourage people, it seems, and the St. Patrick's Brass and Reed Band was playing. Now, the reason I just wanted to re reference that also was to talk about Lord Headley, uh, Charles Allenson Wynne. He was an Irish representative peer, Kerry Landlord, a Cadeau in Kerry, an army man, traveller, adventurer, South America, uh, Africa, um, who was also negotiating um, with his tenants regarding the sale of their estates in County Kerry. Um, not Nagoshal being part of, you know, Arise Not Nagoshal, take your place. Uh, so this was all part of the Headley estate um, that he was still negotiating with. He was, he'd been a long time visitor to the area before buying Rabbit Island. It might also be known as Ilan Nukunin, is it? Or would it be, I think? Uh, near Hedford. The island, about 27 acres, very picturesque part of the lake, beautifully wooded and contains some rich pasture land. Headley was Commodore of the Royal Galway Yacht Club, involved with Galway races with Clombra, Killanen, the Lord Killanen, uh, the Hedford Horse Show. He was a local magistrate, you know, he was Justice of the Peace out in, uh, you know, in, in, in the general Hedford area. Um, the Headley Arms in Hedford was named Farham McCormick's Hotel. Is it still called the Headley Arms? I don't think so, but, you know. So there was such almost to him or such, you know, he was seen as such, you know, somebody to be kind of adulated that he was, that there was a place named after him. His boat, the Vectus, competed in local races. Headley was married and he had one daughter, but there was no mention of them at all in any of the local information about him in Galway. They lived in England. They were, they were, they were never discussed. So I'm not sure what the, circ the circumstances were. He died in 1913, just two years after the last 
um, his last involvement with Kilbeg, age 67, died in Dublin. Uh, and the title passed to his cousin because, of course, it couldn't pass to the daughter, so it passed to his cousin, uh, Roland. And Roland, uh, in turn, Roland Wynne, uh, the new Lord Headley, um, made the news at the time as well because he was a convert to Islam and became associated with Islam, or he was involved with Islam for the rest of his life. So that was kind of one of these, you know, stories of the time as well. Charles Moon of Galway, Moons of Galway, subsequently bought the island in June 1913. Uh, Florence Moon, um, who was married to Charles Moon, was, of course, one of the leading feminists of the era as well. She was involved in the campaign for votes for women, a Birmingham woman who had come to Galway and was involved in the campaign locally. Um, Headley, who seemed to have had status in the general Hedford area, I think, however, was symbolic of a social class that was losing its place in an increasingly democratic world. Not completely, obviously, but it was all over at that particular stage for people of that particular class. But nonetheless, he was given a lot of adulation, uh, it seems, locally. In 1918, the local common man, Galway, held a regatta, considered to be the first Republican regatta, according to one account. So, from the aristocracy of the 1860s to come on in 1918, the regatta had an allure, I think, as a defining pastime of the lake. So, the stories of the Carog, insight into social developments, the history of the steamers can help us chart how wealth and privilege was to give way to a more democratic context in the early 20th century. And I think it can also show how social contexts change. People once politically or socially significant are indeed, you know, just forgotten about as well, you know, in, in, in later, later times. Um, I think the Carob was an extraordinary resource. It was almost a showcase to advertise Galway. You know, people who did come into Galway were taken up. The, a radical association from England who were over in the 1880s proclaiming for home rule were taken up the same as the Lord Lieutenants were, you know. Um, so I think uh, to advertise Galway, its hinterlands, its industries. And I think it still has promised to do the same today. So, Sinead. Oh,